you start franchising yeah, right away? Was my transportation too. So you did, couldn't get to work without walking. Well, is that I, right? I rented the room across the street. Okay. Uh, so I, but at some point, I couldn't when they couldn't pay, so I just slept in the pizza store. Oh man! <laughs> and you were not married at this time? Oh no. Okay. Yeah. I never got into this if I were married. I mean, that'd be hard. A risk like that. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, and, and how did you start building the business then? Uh, it seems like things were very tough. How did you start expanding? What did you get the idea of franchising? Well, sometime after I bought my brother out, uh, things started clicking. And they started clicking because I cut out the uh, six-inch pizza. And that's another story. Of, uh, uh, well, I might as well tell it. Um, we were always busy. We never handled the business. And we sold five sizes of pizza, 6, 9, 12, 14, and 16 inch. All right. And I would say 90 some percent of them were the 6 inch. Oh, really? Yeah, well, people mm. uh, would uh, buy four or five or six of those instead of a bigger pizza. And it took just as much effort or time to make the little one as the big one. I would think, though, that they'd pay more, wouldn't they, for, say, four 6 inches than one big one? Uh, theoretically, yes, but I'm not sure I've sat smart in my pricing. <laughs> The and, economies uh, of scale, you didn't factor uh, all that in. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the small pizza was uh, 30 cents plus 5 cents an item. Mm. And uh, I delivered one of them with a free delivery yeah. all the way across town. I wondered why I wasn't making any money. Right. And, um, and so we, one night, and Sunday night was a big night because they didn't serve meals in the dorms. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bunch of the help didn't show up, and uh, the phone was starting to ring off the hook right off the bat. And, um, and uh, I didn't know whether to open or not. And, um, uh, so someone said, why don't you just uh, cut out the six inch pizza? And I had to make a fast decision. I said, okay, well, that's our game plan. We'll cut out six inch pizza and then when they can't handle that anymore, we'll pull the phones. That was our game plan for the night. We never got busy. Hmm. First night uh, uh, in many, many months that we never got busy. Hmm. Uh, at the end of the night, we uh, found that we did 50% more volume than we ever did before. I'm still not making that register in my head. Well, they had to order a bigger pizza. Right. So you, you sold, so, okay, so you never got busy because people were calling in for six inches and you said, we don't have six inches. Right. And then enough people would buy the bigger pizzas to give you actually a profit. Yeah. Okay. And so the next night, I cut out the nine inch. Uh-huh. And then I uh, just said 12, 14, and then I just, all of a sudden, I'm making money to the Sales are way up. The bills are paid off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one day, um, uh, one of my customers came in. He said, "You know, Tom, you ought to open a place like this at Central Michigan." Mm. Said, That's a long way away. Yeah. He said, "Why?" He said, "Oh, it's uh, uh, it go great up there. Uh, they don't have anything like this there." And so uh, that night, after I closed the shop, I drove up there, um, and. Um, I looked around the campus at 3, 4 in the morning and I saw that they had about oh, five times as many dorms as Eastern. Eastern was a commuter school. Didn't have many dorms. Oh, really? Yeah, they had eight, do eight dorms. None of them were eight was dorms. it called Michigan Normal College back then? Just a teacher school? Or I, think they they just more they, I just think they just changed it to uh, Eastern Michigan University. I think it was Eastern Michigan College and then Eastern Michigan University. Mm -hmm. At this time, when I was there, they had about a little over 4,000 students. And most were commuters. Yeah. Okay. I'm from the Detroit area. Mm-hmm. Um, probably still that way. I know they have some large dorms there, but I don't know but what the percentage like is. Central or Western. Or, or U of M even. Or, or Michigan State is more than anybody mm -hmm. in the country. So um, I, I'm looking around. I see all these dorms. And I see um, that's where most of our business was in Nipsey. Sure. I see the uh, pizza shops that... Uh, uh, they had the menus in the wall. The prices were high. The uh, the ovens were antiquated, and um, and so I um, drove back in time to open my store. And then I managed to uh, get a lease in the back of a greasy spoon. Huh. Uh, uh, for living. No, to uh, no. This was to, for the pizza place. Oh, you were yeah. you were piggybacking it on another business. Yeah, I had to, okay. go, I had, to uh, had to go through the alley to get to our pizza place. <laughs> and, um, but I figured what's the difference? It's delivery, sixty dollar a month rent, mm. cement floor, uh, uh, used equipment, uh, twenty two hundred dollars. Finance that. How do you get the word out? You're in the back of another business. How are people going to know about you? I put an ad in the uh, 
and the name of that second unit was called Pizza King. Mm. I put an ad in the back of the school paper, great big letters, Pizza mm. King, free delivery. Mm. And uh, it was such a small campus, and uh, I don't think anybody had free delivery. And back then, everybody was reading print. We didn't have the internet oh, yeah. or other uh, and, distractions. Uh, and they just uh, put uh, the menus in the dorms, and in those days, you could ah. get them to put them in the, in the mailboxes. In the wow. Dorms. And so it was a booming business right off the bat. Mm. And, uh, uh, and then uh, and, uh, it was on the second delivery that I personally took in that store that I met my wife. Oh, she was a student at Central. Yes. Okay. Um, she was working on a switchboard in one of the dorms. Very good. And was it love at first sight? It was with me, but not with her. <laughs> uh, yeah, she was just uh, so cute. And um, and I hadn't been dating because I'd been working seven days a week for years. Mm. And um, and very shy with girls. Mm. And so uh, I try to say what conversation. She's not a talkative person. Mm. And I'm shy. And so uh, I was getting nowhere. And then the customer came down and got her pizza. And I'm going back to the store. And I'm all excited. And I said, i got to get a, I gotta see if I can get a date with this girl. So I got back to the store and I asked my guy I was training uh, as a pizza maker uh, if he was good enough yet to give me a night off, Monday, my slowest night. He said, I'm ready. And I knew he wasn't, but I didn't care. I, <laughs> I called up to the dorm and uh, asked, uh, I got the girl's footboard, asked her, she called the movie the next Monday and said, who are you? She said, I'm the guy that just delivered a pizza to you less than 10, 10 minutes ago. And the daughter was aware and said, I don't know who you are. They said, oh, I just came on duty. I said, well, who'd you replace? She said, Bonnie Hula. I said, oh, well, would you ring her room? Rings her room. Um, I get my nerve up again, make a spiel. Uh, who are you? I'm the guy that just delivered a pizza while you were working on the switchboard. Mm -hmm. More than 15 minutes ago. And I said, I had this other girl substitute for me. Oh. I said, well, what's your name? So... Uh, that's funny. Uh, so I got her on the phone and asked her, and she said yes. And and on the, I think it was after the second date, it happened to be Valentine's Day, a day the day after, and I sent her up a heart-shaped pizza to her room. Oh. And um, and I think it was on the third date, uh, it was right after that, I showed up with an engagement ring. Wow. She and you've been married how many years now? Fifty-two in August. Fantastic. Well, it's an indication of your perseverance, I think, there that we've seen throughout your life that you don't want to take no for an answer. <laughs> well, she did say no. She's, but after a week, I got her to say yes. Yeah. I saw her every day for a week. And you have four children now, and they're, they're all grown? Yeah, I have four children, eight grandchildren, and, uh, one on the way, and, uh, ah. and uh, my youngest daughter uh, has twins on the way. I'm going to ask you another controversial question, more controversial for me, I think, than you, because I teach entrepreneurship for a living, and I love it. But one of my students uh, actually picked this up. I, I didn't give her this information. She looked at People magazine, where you had quoted, uh, they were asking about your success, obviously, and you said, I owe it to stupidity. The best teacher is just doing. Would you still say that, that really there's not much you can learn about being an entrepreneur, but you just you just do it and work it out. Yeah, I'm not one of those people who are paralyzed with analysis. Hmm. You know, I um, uh, when I get an idea, I want to do it. I get itchy. I want to do it. I, I know it's right, and, at least in my mind, and, and I do it. And of course, a lot of times it, it doesn't work out, but uh, 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 a good many of times it does. And um, uh, and I've always said I'm blessed with ignorance. Hmm. But the truth of the matter is, while I'm still a freshman in college, I've probably read more than one book a week mm -hmm. in my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been novels. It's always been things that uh, uh, I felt could help me in some way. Okay. Uh, and, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I came up with a, 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 a philosophy for life. I was aboard ship, nothing to do with daydream. And, um, about all the things I was going to do when I got out of the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, all the things I was going to have, and, and kind of had a sort of an empty feeling, so what? I thought, well, what is important? And um, and we were stuck out there because our rudder was damaged, so we were out in the water quite a while with nothing mm -hmm. to do. And I'm uh, thinking about, uh, well, 
uh, yeah, I want to be very successful. But, uh, but I realized that if I lost my health, I'd give every penny I got to get it back. Mm -hmm. So uh, it must be that being healthy is pretty darn important. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to live to be 100. I'm going to be healthy. Okay. Um, and I thought, well, it doesn't do any good to be healthy and have the body of a Greek god and uh, all kinds of energy if you if uh, if mentally you're not healthy too. Right. So I want to use my mind. Mm -hmm. I want to learn. Um, and, uh, and I knew that the average person uses 10 to 20 percent of their brain. I wanted to do more mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so I said, okay, I got to be, I got to use my mind. So that's more important. Than, that's more important than the physical. I'd rather be a paraplegic in a wheelchair with a sound mind than be a uh, physical specimen with nothing between my ears. I agree. And then, uh, yeah, but they're still not there. Mm. you got to live in this world with other people. Right. So relationships are important, mm. more important. Very. Uh, particularly with my wife, with my kids, but with everybody. You gotta practice the golden rule. Mm. So now I'm starting to get somewhere. And I say, yeah, I'm going to die someday. Mm. And I'm either going to go to heaven or I'm going to go to hell. Mm. So that has to be my top priority. Um, and the Catholic Church tells you how to do that. Mm. You just die in the state of sanctifying grace. Well, so I said, okay, I'm going to, those are my five priorities. Spiritual, mm -hmm. social, mental, physical, and financial. Mm. It was like a light bulb went off. So, in that order? Oh, yeah, like it has to be hierarchy. Order. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a hierarchy. Yeah. And, uh, um, and that enabled me to... Uh, uh, Exercise my desire to be successful. Mm. Now I can justify it. Ah. See, because it was for good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, if it's just for me and for pleasure, it's not. It's, it's pretty empty and meaningless. Gosh, I wish we had three more hours, and there's so many things I want to ask. But I'm, I'm going to touch on one thing that's very important. But before we leave, I want to ask you about Jairene because I have two Marines in one of my classes who are asking about that, which is your new burger um, <laughs> idea, burger delivery idea. But um, in, in the 80s, um, I, I've read that uh, you know, we know that you sold Domino's for quite a lot of money um, and became one of the wealthiest men in America. And you were building, I'm going to call it a palace for your family to live in. But you stopped construction on that and made some kind of commitment to give away all your money to Catholic causes before the end of life. And I have to applaud you because you're obviously well on your way to doing that, having put a lot of money into it, uh, starting a university, Catholic university. and and we were at Domino's Farms, and there's a Catholic radio station, and my daughter goes to a Catholic high school across the street that I'm sure you help support. So thank you for that. But if, if, as much as you want to share, because this is not common, um, it is common for people to get a lot of wealth and realize that's not the source of their happiness, but it's not common for people with that level of wealth to say, I'm going to give it away. Can you share something about that? Wow. Well, um, I don't know how to capsulize that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always kind of had the feeling I was going to be successful. I just knew it. I mean, that's silly, but I knew it. Um, and uh, I wanted it to be used for the most good. And I basically wanted to help the Catholic Church. Um, didn't know how back then. Um, uh, but when things started happening, and, and, and things happened, they happened fast. I mean, I was 20 years struggling up and down, up and down. Uh, and then in 1980 uh, to 89, we were the fastest growing restaurant chain in history. Uh, in 1985, we opened 954 units, more than any restaurant chain Incredible. in history. We broke an old KFC record of about 800. Mm. And um, and all of a sudden, I'm showing up on the Fortune uh, uh, top 500. Uh, the short part, the short list probably of that 500. It was moving up fast. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it was pretty sudden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, uh, one of the reasons I did so well back, because I was so focused. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and that's a very important key to success. And it was for me. Uh, nobody had a more limited menu in their, in their, in their stores than I did. Mm -hmm. And pizza and Coke. Yeah. 
in those days, and we had two sizes, the pizza and mm -hmm. one size of food. Mm -hmm. And uh, no sit-down facilities. Uh, and uh, the franchisees continually pressuring to add subs or add other drinks or add tables, and, and I was always saying no. Mm. Uh, and uh, that was one of the best things I did was say no. Mm. And uh, because I had a vision, and I knew that if we, and what, what we were uh, doing in delivery was still so untapped that if I, if I get distracted, we're not going to reach that potential. And, uh, and um, but then in the, um, when I bought the Tigers. This was 83, right? I bought, well, in the fall mm. of 83, I bought mm. the Tigers. And all of a sudden, uh, there's no question about whether Tom Monahan's a successful. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the biggest sports story probably in 10 years in mm. the state of Michigan. Because in those days, baseball was by far the most valuable franchise in sports. Mm -hmm. um, it, I read you bought it for $54 million when it was, probably wasn't worth that, but you were so in love with the Tigers. Is that, is yeah, that I true? I didn't care what the price was. So the reason <laughs> I was able to buy it, and a lot of other people wanted it, uh, a lot of well-known uh, Michigan families, is because I told Mr. Fetzer, whom we really got along with, mm -hmm. um, that he said, of, he said, if you, uh, when I sell the, if I sell the Tigers, I'll sell them to you. Mm. But he didn't want to sell at the time, no, no. right? He thought yeah. he was going to live forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was 83 then. And, um, and I said, well, Mr. Fetzer, if you give me the honor of being able to own the Tigers, I'll pay you any price you pay. Now, he's a very frugal German. Uh -huh. And so I knew what I was saying. I didn't think he'd be anywhere near that high. Mm. But to me, it wasn't a matter of money. It was, uh, there was mm. only one Detroit Tigers, and ah. so you can't really put a price on it. And uh, so. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me just maybe expect that. Go ahead. So that's the number he gave me, but it was about six months later. Um, and I uh, about fell over, but I, um, I said yes. It was 50 million plus 4 million on the note I took over. And the year after you bought them, Tigers won the World Series. So I imagine that was just a thrill for you. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure it was as big a thrill as buying them. Oh. Because mm -hmm. that was such a cloak and dagger experience because we had to do everything in the, in the deepest secrecy because mm -hmm. uh, he made it very clear. He just hated the press. If the word gets out, the deal's dead. Mm -hmm. And you honored that, obviously. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I had to or I didn't because I wouldn't be able to buy him. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I mean, when we went on a meeting somewhere, uh, we put tape over the domino on the airplane. Mm. <laughs> oh. uh, we did uh, kind of uh, crazy things to not let the word get out. Was and, there something about the Tigers and owning the Tigers that led them to this decision a few years later to uh, to give your money away? It's, uh, I think, a, well, I always wanted to give the money away. Uh, uh, and uh, when I was spending money like a drunken sailor, um, on the uh, yachts, jets, helicopters, the lodge up north, um, big Frank Lloyd Wright collection, um, cars. Mm. Uh, uh, I always said I'm not spending money, I'm investing it. I always had a justification. Mm. I mean, a plane, I mean, that saves time, time's money. Ah. Uh, the lodge is a R, &R for our. Uh, franchisees and their employees, uh, the fire incentive program, um, and so on. The same with the with the yachts and the, mm. um, uh, and the cars, of course. Uh, they might appreciate actually those cars. Yeah, well, classic I, cars. That's what I said. They did. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I knew cars, mm -hmm. and I, I knew which ones were classics and which weren't, and which and I always loved the cars. Uh, so I thought I'm buying cars that are going to invest, that are going to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I'm promoting uh, the company. Yeah, you've had a lot of publicity, I remember, for those yeah, items. Well, I, I, mean, I bought the Duesenberg, uh, first car sold at auction for a million dollars. The car is probably worth about 600000 I was hoping it goes to a million because she had about 500 members of the press there at the Harris uh, Museum mm. and, uh, and from all over the world. And I was hoping that whoever's bid against me would keep going up because I wanted to hit a million mm. because I knew that would be a big story. I'd get a million dollars worth of publicity. Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, 
But somewhere in the 80s, you, you turned course a little bit and, and well, stopped investing in these kind of ventures. Yeah. Um, I think I'm trying to say is I was kind of walking a tightrope. I wanted to, I knew the most important thing in my life was to be a good Catholic. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think what I was trying to do was be a billionaire saint. Ah. I wanted to have both this world and the next. Mm. Um and uh, um, and because at the same time I was giving a lot of money away um, to almost all Catholic causes or pro-life things, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I started the goddess during that period. Um, That's a Catholic CEO, the Catholic yes. Executives mm -hmm. Network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of other things. Uh, the Mother Teresa film that uh, was seen all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't pay for the whole thing, but I got it back on track after it was stalled. Mm -hmm. um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I gave the seed money to start that, to set up a staff and everything. I mean, great investments. So I was doing things uh, um, uh, for the church, but um, and planned on doing more later. Mm -hmm. um, but when I picked up that book, C.S. Lewis. Oh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Christ Lewis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the chapter on pride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was... Uh, it's my favorite chapter, too. Pardon? It's my favorite chapter in that book, too. It, it hit me between the eyes. I read it 20 years ago. And I, I tell you, you was writing it for me because uh, uh, I always thought that uh, uh, my hard work and my giving up things when I was younger so I could have more later was smart. And uh, I saw this great uh, when uh, you're playing baseball to, to hustle and dive and risk your body to make a great play. Um, and all I was doing was trying to get attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and when I was trying to have less, having less now, so I have more later in businesses, I was just trying to have, he said, more than others. Not more, it's more than others. Right. And that's what hit me right between the eyes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I always knew I had a, uh, problem with with uh, trying to impress people mm. uh, and, um, and, I, and I, then I came up many times in confession but then when I read this book I really I, I it. if pride's the biggest of sins I got to be the biggest sinner in the world mm. and so I said I got to get off this train so I, I took what I call a millionaire's vow of poverty and I gave up all the ostentatious toys sold it all I think about luxuries, uh, conveniences, but I gave up uh, all the of luxuries. I remember I saw you on a plane two weeks ago and you were sitting just in front of me in coach and that in itself was a statement uh, that well, you would... I don't, I don't, up until about a year ago, I've been flying back and forth to Florida for 10 years mm -hmm. and um, uh, I was flying coach. In fact, uh, they upgraded me a lot and I traded the ticket with somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, in the last year or two, I've, I've been upgrading, and I'll sit in first class. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's so much easier to go to the bathroom because I'm drinking a lot of water. Mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, I, I kind of got a little spoiled. Well, you're, one, then, you're so wonderfully yeah. honest, I really appreciate it. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but if we could spend a little time, because I know you have a new venture. I'm excited, I get excited about new ventures, and I know some of my students, particularly the Marines, are. You're looking at a hamburger delivery business. I guess it's already started in Tennessee. If you could just tell us about that, what your vision is for that. Well, I hate to disappoint you, mm. but it's, it's an artistic success, but it's not a financial success. Yet. So you've been doing about three years, is that right? It's been... Uh... I about two and a half. I opened two stores in uh, Naples, and uh, then I basically moved up here. Mm. And they never really. Um, we had uh, a lot of repeat business, good reviews. Mm. It's just that uh, they, they were they were near enough business to break even. Uh, so have you closed the franchises? I closed them, and I moved moved the equipment into one to uh, Tennessee. When I, when I found a guy who looked like he might be a good operator. He's a former Marine Corps officer, and he's. He's doing a good job, and his uh, sales are climbing, but it's not at break even yet. So you have one store in Knoxville one right store. now? Okay. Yeah. All right. So 
it's persistence anyhow. Most people wouldn't lose this kind of money for mm -hmm. uh, the, what, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. I'm still, uh, I have big dreams for it, but uh, it's all dependent on this one. Because I'm not going to uh, have anybody invest in the franchise until I Showing them that the one works. Mm -hmm. It's just an education process of getting people to get hamburgers delivered. Right. Are you promising ten minutes or, or less? No, for we're averaging ten minutes. You're averaging ten. Minutes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seems like a good idea to me. I mean, yeah, it's hamburgers. Number one are menu item of a ten minute delivery. I think that's a good combination. You spoke earlier about the pizzas, and you, you got rid of the six-inch, basically because the economies of scale weren't there, putting all this gasoline and time into a small little pizza. Do you think that's a, a problem with the hamburgers, that we're getting a lot of orders for one? Well, we uh, don't take an order for one. You got a nine ninety nine minimum. I see. It's still probably too low, but uh, um, there is a lot of people that order one and fries and they drink, and mm -hmm. they get somewhere up around that price. Um, when I started out, I just had... Uh, uh, two hamburgers, no substitutes, no drinks. Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, <laughs> People wanted to specialize more than that. Phone wasn't ringing much. I think if it ever got to where the volume was good, uh, you'd get somewhere near that. Because then you can really mass produce them and give that great service. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you know when the rushes are coming, you can put them on the grill ahead. And yes. Try to time it so that as soon as they come off the grill, the phone rings, and they go out the door. Uh, and with such a the assembly line because you'd have such a limited menu. I agree. My first job was at 16 working at the A&W here in Ann Arbor and I was the hamburger cook and oh my gosh, you're right. From from about 11.45 to maybe 1.15 that grill was full and it took me a few weeks to get into the rhythm so that I could manage that many and eventually I did. Mm -hmm. And then of course a lot of the other time just twiddling your thumbs. Mm -hmm. Onesies and twosies here and there. Um, I wanted to ask you Mr. Monahan if we have a minute about Actually, one of my students did, and it's something we talk about in the course, is crystal balling, looking to the future, and obviously you're, you're natural at this. You're always looking at the future. Um, and I don't know if you've read any of the work of Clayton Christensen, who's at Harvard, who did uh, the innovators. Uh, he did the innovators DNA, the innovators uh, dilemma. But he's shown that in industry after industry, it's been the small, um, kind of versatile, aggressive companies like yourself that have come in at the bottom of the market and offered something that can appeal to a lot more people. And I think you fit this model because you're appealing to college students who often don't have a lot of money. And then you work your way up and then you, you eventually knock off the big guys, which as you, you did, you had the uh, largest growing uh, restaurant chain in the world. Um, so one of my questions, students asked, what's next? What, what, what are the industries that are really gonna be disrupted? What are the opportunities going forward? Any thoughts on that? No, because I'm not thinking about that. Mm. I'm thinking about the uh, university, the law school, like and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, education, which is my field, is changing dramatically.